Hi everyone, welcome to Osteobytes. My name is Christina Iptoma and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and Director of Scientific Programs for MIB Agents. And today on Osteobytes, we are talking with Dr. Mark Manula about key findings in immunotherapies from his lab, as well as those that have shaped the landscape of both human and canine cancers with a focus on EGFR and HER2-based immunotherapies for osteosarcoma and mangiosarcoma and other cancer types in canine patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Manila, for joining us on Osteobytes. We are thrilled to have you. And um, we are also joined by Camille, who is an osteo warrior. She's a member of our MIB Agents Junior Advisory Board, and she is also co-host of our AYA cancer podcast, Osteo. Camille, so glad you can make it today. Thank you um, so much. Yeah. So um, a little bit more about our guest today. Um, a professor at the Yale University School of Medicine, Dr. Mark Mamela's interests are in investigating the early events of inflammatory mediated changes in the proteome that intersect with cellular metabolism and with breaking immune tolerance to self proteins. These studies have been applied to the development of novel immune therapeutic approaches for anti tumor vaccines in EGFR, HER2 expressing cancers, including breast cancer and colon cancer. And in particular, the work has evolved to clinical trials in companion canine populations. Overall, it is the goal of Dr. Manuela's lab to understand the mechanisms that may shift the balance of the cellular proteome toward the initiation of anti-self immune responses. And in addition, seminal work from the Manuela lab elucidated the proteomics, biochemical forms of autoantigens capable of breaking immunologic tolerance to intracellular autoantigens in type 1 diabetes and in systemic lupus erythematosus. Simply put, Dr. Manula examines post-translational protein modifications that alter cellular biology and immunity. And recent studies have identified early protein modifications of pancreatic beta cells that are sentinels of early disease and dysfunction of glucose metabolism and insulin release. And finally, studies from the Manula lab first demonstrated the ability of B lymphocytes to present autoantigens in the triggering of T-cell autoimmunity and in the phenomenon of epitope spreading in lupus autoimmunity and work that contributed to the rationale of B-cell mediated therapeutics, rituximab and belumimab in SLE. And Dr. Mamula has 113 publications and has mentored over 30 pre and postdoctoral students and investigators, many of whom have been acquired faculty positions as independent investigators at major medical schools, universities and pharmaceutical industries. Welcome, Dr. Mamula, and everyone, welcome joining us today. Please feel free to add your questions for Dr. Mamula to the Q&A as we go. And um, before we get started <clears throat> with this presentation, we have some announcements and reminders. Um, for bereaved parents of osteosarcoma angels, we have a new series of our Healing Hearts program starting in September. Healing Hearts for Bereaved Parent Sessions on Wednesdays and Sundays run through the end of the year. And we also have different sessions for young adult siblings and then yet another session for teen siblings. And so I'll put some info in the chat on how to sign up for those. Um, we also have our next virtual tumor board for osteosarcoma, which we fondly call Turbo, um, on September 13th. And um, it's an educational forum open to clinicians and researchers interested in osteosarcoma. If you're interested in attending Turbo or would like to present a case, I'll put a link to a short form in the chat. Um, so that meeting is September 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and lastly, we are gearing up for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in September. And with a $25 donation, you'll receive a beautiful big gold bow that you can adorn your mailbox or front porch with to raise awareness for pediatric cancer. And you can show support for families impacted um, by pediatric cancer. And the funds raised from the bows will support programs, education, and research for the osteosarcoma community. So I'll put some more info in the chat about that. Camille, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Hey, everyone. I'm Camille Wall. I am 20 years old. I live right outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm an osteo warrior. I was initially diagnosed um, in January of 2013 with a, a tumor in my right tibia and spread to both my lungs. Um, and I just finished uh, chemo for my eighth recurrence. And I'm also um, a host of Osteo, MIB's AYA podcast. So she's basically an all-around badass, basically. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Dr. Manila, we'll have you go ahead and share your slides and get started. Sure. Thank you, uh, Christina and Camille. This is honestly a, a terrific um, 
uh, honor and a, a privilege to be a part of this uh, this broadcast and and your efforts. And I applaud you and what you do uh, immensely. It's always the behind the scene warriors that uh, make the most difference, really, in in pushing not only awareness but pushing the science forward, pushing the technology and the therapy forward. So uh, I, I couldn't be, again, happier to be a part of this program. And I, I pulled up some of the previous presentations on YouTube. Uh, the bar is very high. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint you. Uh, and for all of you that are out there, please feel free to ask questions, interrupt during um, this presentation, which should be about 30 or 40 minutes maybe, but uh, I always like a, a dynamic, interactive uh, presentation. So if there's anything, uh, even there are no bad questions uh, uh, to what we do, um, please ask and please uh, interject your own experiences as well. So uh, you can't get enough of puppy pictures, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a model of what's well, not a model it's real cancer in dogs osteosarcoma of course uh and uh how we got there uh from my background and where we are going uh actually by way of introduction and, and thank you christina for that uh length over overbaked a little bit presentation of what i've done in my career uh I can distill that all in about two sentences, which I've, I'm an immunologist by training, and uh, I've always been interested in how we can either improve uh, immune responses to some uh, things that we want to do that to. For example, infectious disease obviously is a, uh, is a clinical entity that we would like to have better immunity to protect ourselves from, and tumors, for example. For, uh, that we would also want to enhance immunity. There are times when we want to turn off immune responses, and that relates to my background in autoimmune diseases like lupus and type 1 diabetes. Multiple sclerosis is another autoimmune disease. And these are diseases in which the immune system attacks uh, your own tissues. In lupus, it's tissues like kidney and central nervous system and skin. Uh, diabetes, it's the pancreas, uh, etc. So in learning a lot about these interactions of your own tissues with the immune system, that's what led us to tum under wanting to uh, improve or further investigate how our immune systems can attack tumors. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, publications out there um, in both the general and the specific scientific worlds that have already appreciated how animals, dogs and cats in this case, can contribute to our understanding of all sorts of human diseases. Uh, this is a New York Times uh, Sunday magazine uh, that came out gosh, I think back in 2017, that uh, emphasized that there's a lot we can learn uh, from these diseases that dogs get, for example, and apply them to human disease. So again, today, obviously, we'll, we'll focus on the cancers that dogs get, how we treat them, and how they can potentially lead to human therapies. And it's important up front to point out that uh, they're good models because they're virtually identical uh, between dogs and humans. Uh, the biomarkers, so-called biomarkers, the things that sit on the surface of tumor cells, as well as inside the tumor cells are virtually identical. This is true for melanoma, uh, the herb B family proteins, which I'll talk uh, at great length about today. Uh, other proteins like carcinoembryonic antigen signaling pathways, mutations in various tumor proteins, uh, CKIT, for example, ABLE CD20, uh, P53 oncogenes. Uh, but the important thing here is they look and smell and taste and 
respond to treatment virtually identical to what our experience is in human cancers. They're identical virtually in histology, the genetics, and the mutations that arise between uh, cancers in humans and dogs uh, overlap almost identically. The behavior, how they mutate, uh, how they metastasize are very similar between dogs and humans. Uh, regarding osteosarcoma specifically, the primary um, target of metastatic disease, like in humans, is in the lung, can be other tissues as well. Uh, and then importantly, for what immunologists like myself study, the therapeutic responses are very similar. Uh, as are mechanisms of why tumors resist immune therapies or resist other drug therapies. So, okay, this is going to be a one or two minute entire course in the immune system. You'll all be experts after in the next two minutes. This is how we respond to any foreign antigen, uh, a bacteria or a virus or anything that comes in contact with our skin or maybe gets through our skin and maybe inhaled or uh, by virtue of infection or open wounds, for example. Uh, what is called an antigen? Can you see my arrow, by the way? Uh, okay, good. Yeah. So uh, these proteins from bacteria or viruses get taken up, basically eaten by what are called antigen presenting cells. In this case, it's a dendritic cell can be a macrophage. These are all white blood cells, for example. They originate in your bone marrow, and they are all over your body. They're in virtually all tissues. So these dendritic cells will take up proteins and even whole bacteria or whole viruses, and they'll present little, small, short pieces of protein on the surface. And that's important because by doing that, they can so-called prime or activate other important cells of the immune system. And again, these are all white subsets of white blood cells. In this case, it's a T cell. That T cell, if the receptor on the surface is specific for that short peptide or protein, it will multiply and it will differentiate and mature into a so-called killer cell or a helper cell. Uh, the killer cell, of course, is important in cancer immunotherapy. I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Helper T cells are also very important in cancer immunotherapies. They have several functions. Uh, notably, they help, they're called helper T cells because they help another lymphocyte, another white blood cell called B cells. Uh, they help them to differentiate uh, into cells that end up spitting out antibodies. These antibodies go back and find the infection or the virus or the bacteria, clear it, and that's how we would survive. So a nice intact pathway that you're looking at right now is important for survival and um, avoiding um, infections and uh, other pathogens. Now, we can also train this same response, same cells, uh, same things on the surface of the cells to not attack necessarily pathogens, but attack tumors or tumor proteins. And therein lies the topic of cancer immunotherapies is to develop, uh, to develop immune responses that attack tumors. And I'll go into great detail there. Now, important to this concept is a term called tolerance. We know that we generally don't, our immune systems generally do not attack most normal tissues like our skin and our toes and muscle or heart uh, tissues or kidney tissues. There are exceptions to that, and that's the case of autoimmune diseases where the immune system uh, has defects that start to attack those organs. So in this process, these dendritic cells and other cells present proteins from all of these organs, and they tell T cells to be quiet, to turn off, or even to die so that we don't get autoimmune diseases. So that'll be relevant for how we think about cancer therapies. Now, 
uh, I'm also going to talk about checkpoint inhibitors in, in general and in cancer therapy. The reason uh, this pathway called checkpoint inhibitors evolved was that, let me go back actually. So once these T cells go off and find their pathogen and they're attacking, say, a virus infected cell, once they clear the virus, you don't want these T cells around anymore, these killer T cells. So you have to turn them off. And therein uh, is the mechanism of turning off T cells by virtue of these two proteins on the surfaces of cells. Uh, on the T cell, it's called PD1. Uh, on the tumor cell, or actually on an infected uh, viral infected cell, it's called PDL1. These things engage. Uh, and it serves to turn off. It's a negative signal to the T cell. The T cell does, doesn't do its job anymore, and it goes away. And that's good. When you want to dampen the immune response after you've cleared an infection, for example, that's good. Otherwise, you don't want these cells activated continuously. Now, the case of wanting to use the immune system to attack tumor cells is very different. You want to keep those T cells activated for as long as you can at the site of the tumor. And this is what this panel uh, describes. The tumor cell uh, wants to survive, of course. So it has developed this mechanism of expressing this protein called PDL1. It tells the T cell to be quiet and get turned off. Uh, and this, this T cell is no longer capable of killing the tumor cell. However, therapies have been developed based on this pathway that block or interfere with this off signal and thereby keeping the T cell turned on and it can go uh, and attack this cell or the next cell. The, the T cell stays essentially perpetually turned on. So that it can do its job. And its job in this case is killing tumor cells. Uh, and this, as we all know and already appreciate, has really changed the landscape of not only uh, osteosarcoma treatment, but also many other tumor types, breast and colon cancer, lung cancer, melanoma in humans, et cetera. So there are lots of... Sorry, are they yes. equally effective, the anti pdl one or anti-PD-1? Like, are they equally... Effective, or does it depend on on the type of disease? You ask a very good question. Uh, it's a difficult question to perfectly answer, and that is because tumors that express PDL1, it's a very dynamic process. The levels, the amount of PDL1 on a particular tumor cell uh, changes dramatically over the course of disease. So if you look today at a particular tumor cell, in a human or in a dog, and you can stain or you can see PDL1. If you look tomorrow or a month from now, that level may change. And it again, it's a dynamic process because this is literally a war. The tumor cell wants to survive. Uh, the immune system wants to, wants to kill off the tumor cell. The tumor cell is trying to preserve itself. So the levels may change. Um, so that's where. For example, the amount or how you interfere with this pathway may change not only over the course of a single patient, treating a single patient, but uh, also uh, over the course of treating different types of cancers. Different cancers are known to uh, express different levels of these proteins, for example, PDL1. There are other, uh, there are all, this is not the only one that turns off T cells. This is one of the popular ones. The tumor cell also makes several other types of uh, off signals to the T cell. So it's it tends to get a bit complicated. Um, uh, and then the side effects also differ depending on whether you're blocking PDL1 or uh, PD1. Okay. There are a number of therapies that have been pioneered in dogs that have led to better therapies in humans. These include bone marrow transplantation, limb sparing uh, surgery for osteosarcoma. I'll have a slide about that in a minute. Toxicity testing for various drugs, uh, various drugs for different cancers, 
Metronomic chemotherapy is continuous low-dose therapy that's now used in both humans and dogs for certain types of cancer. And uh, I think uh, a previous speaker, Dr. Reagan from Colorado State, gave a very nice lecture in this series about losartan and tisarinib, uh, both used in dogs and humans. This is an example of uh, early um, x-rays, of course, in limb sparing surgery that has, uh, again, whoops, has again um, improved how we treat this disease. Uh, I can tell you that uh, at least in the veterinary world, uh, surgeons with expertise in this are a bit difficult to find. Um, I think certainly easier to find in uh, human cancer care. Uh, of course, advances in human cancer care have been translated to treating dog cancers, including various chemotherapies, uh, therapeutic radiation, uh, palliative radiation therapy, and of course, this advent of checkpoint inhibitor therapies, which are now uh, only recently being translated in dogs. A lot of these drugs are familiar to you. Uh, they were used primarily uh, early on in uh, human cancer care and are now uh, uh, a mainstay, if you will, for uh, canine cancer care as well. All right, so I'm going to talk about how to turn on the immune system to start attacking cancers. And it's going to uh, be important to understand the approach of how we've done this. And it's an approach called using neoantigens. Neo means new. It means something that your immune system has never seen. In the case of cancer, it's a part of a cancer cell or a protein that your immune system has never seen and can potentially turn on immune responses to uh, attack the tumor, for example. And that's illustrated here. It's a, it's a part of the tumor that your immune system's never uh, never seen, and it could include different modifications that happen on the protein or mutations, for example. A mutation that happens in the middle of your uh, cancer growing may be a new protein that your immune system has never seen, and there are ways we can utilize that. Uh, the way we found find them is uh, some sophisticated technologies in the laboratory, including um, mass spectroscopy, which can take up protein or, a sh or pieces of protein and can really uh, dive into the molecular basis and the sequences, both the DNA sequences and the amino acid sequence of various uh, tumor proteins. And then what do we do with them? Well, if we find them, we can either make a vaccine, that's what we did, and I'll describe that. They can be used for diagnostics. If you see them in the plasma or the serum of cancer patients. They can tell you things about what's happening in the tumor itself, uh, and we can monitor the progression of disease. This is one example uh, that has already been published. This is done frequently in human cancers, identifying these neoantigens and then potentially using them for therapy. So in this case, you get a tumor out of uh, a host, out of a human, uh, and you can, what's called immunoprecipitate, all it means is you grab that antigen or that short protein off the surfaces of cells, and you can analyze them by sophisticated technologies, and then you can put them in a, uh, a brew, if you will, and vaccinate. So you've already, you've been able to find a unique peptide or protein from the original tumor, end up with a vaccine. Uh, another way to do it is do uh, DNA sequencing from the tumor, identify mutations that arise along the way. Uh, we can synthesize now those proteins or those short peptides with those mutations and, again, create sometimes vaccines, either protein or peptide vaccines, or, you know, with these new technologies that we already know about in uh, vaccine uh, development, for example, RNA vaccines that are how the COVID vaccine has been developed, uh, they will find their way into D, uh, cancer, uh, uh, RNA cancer-based vaccines. 
Uh, the interesting thing about these is that they can trigger very good immune responses that get T cells, get these white blood cells to invade and find the tumors. Uh, the difficult part here is picking the right neoantigen. You're going to find a lot of them if you look hard enough, and only a small fraction of them are actually good to use in therapy. So you have to get both a little lucky and use a little, uh, and then there's some other intellectual input that uh, directs you in which neoantigens to use. Uh, uh, what, manual, yep. Just go back to basics. So like, so, um, so my understanding, right, is, uh, uh, DNA makes RNA, which makes proteins. And then, so proteins are made up of peptides. Is that right? Is that the hierarchy here? Perfect. Okay. And, um, and so for the different types of vaccines, I mean, is there, you'd mentioned we have the, the RNA based vaccine that was like the COVID vaccine. And so, um, like what would be the kind of pros and cons or differences of a peptide vaccine versus an RNA vaccine. Well, you make a really good point, which I'll actually show you some data for. Uh, the RNA vaccines that we know uh, that uh, COVID uh, uh, has been developed with, the RNA gets in, it requires a living cell to make the protein inside of. So the RNA will get inside the cell, use the protein making machinery and then that covid protein or the covid peptide gets spit out of the cell and then it gets taken up by remember that dendritic cell that i showed you in the first slide so that's what triggers the immune response to covid vaccination uh, in a similar manner dna vaccines require live cells they get into the cell uh the dna gets uh, made into rna the rna into protein and again, the protein gets spit out of the cell and taken up into that immune processing pathway. So, and then the last option is if you start with a protein, uh, and there are many protein-based and peptide-based vaccinations, those peptides or those proteins can just get directly taken up by those dendritic cells and spit out onto the surface and trigger an immune response. So the peptide or protein-based vaccines don't require a living cell. They just go straight to the dendritic cell and trigger immune responses. So it bypasses a little bit of the early steps. There are some reasons to use RNA or DNA vaccines or even protein vaccines, and it's based on the longevity, the, the how robust the immune response is. Uh, some proteins don't do well. Uh, as proteins or peptides, they should be administered as um, RNA or DNA vaccines. This is just a real life example of cancer patients. Uh, this happens to be lung cancer, having T cells that get activated to these neoantigens that were identified from their own tumors. So if you can take just this first one, for example, it's a bit of a complicated slide, but I'll distill it. So uh, it, this type of study was trying to define mutations in proteins uh, in a cancer patient. Uh, you find that mutation and you get cells from the patient and you ask, does that mutation activate the T cell? Meaning it's, it's activated T cells in the patient. These blue dots, or these blue squares um, are above the red squares. And that means, yes, this patient has a lot of these T cells that got activated to the mutation and don't respond to the non-mutated peptide or protein. This patient, 1139, has a lot of T cells to a lot of different mutations uh, compared to the proteins that don't have the mutation. That's called the wild type. So it means it's a real life phenomenon. Okay. This is what's happening in the tumor. You get these tumor antigens or the neoantigens, possibly. They get released, again, taken up by a dendritic cell, Christina. Uh, they travel to lymph nodes. They activate those T cells and B cells to make antibodies and T cells. T cells get released from the lymph nodes. Let's see, where am I? Um, they find their way to the tumor, hopefully, and start attacking the tumor. 
the tumor starts dying, hopefully, uh, which releases more proteins, and it's a cycle. And it's a positive cycle, um, hopefully. The problem is, as we pointed out earlier, the tumor is making checkpoint inhibitors, uh, or I'm sorry, checkpoints that inhibit the T cells uh, at the site of the tumor. So we can boost or artificially activate this cycle by adding these neoantigens at uh, the early stages of this cycle. And this is what we are essentially doing. So we're adding neoantigens that go right into the dendritic cells. That's what I was describing earlier, Christina. Um, and can activate T cells that go to the tumor, hopefully, and antibodies and start killing off the tumor. So the one we're interested in is a family of proteins called EGFR uh, or ERB B. Uh, the, the family members are EGFR or two or three or four. All of these are found on tumors, uh, on osteosarcoma, for example, which expresses EGFR and HER2. Uh, this just shows all of the different types of human cancers that express this family of proteins. This is EGFR, HER2, HER3. Uh, the notable ones are breast and colon cancer, ovarian cancer, for example. You know there are drugs, there are monoclonal antibodies. Herceptin, for example, is an antibody therapy that binds HER2 that's used to treat HER2-positive breast cancers. Um, and that's one example. So this is how the pathway works. Uh, these are important pathways because they are tumor growth uh, signaling pathways. These family members that are, again, expressed on tumors, uh, as you can see here, uh, get activated. They form, actually, the each protein, it forms a, what's called a dimer, two proteins that stick together on the cell surface. In this case, uh, it could be EGFR dimerizing with another EGFR protein, uh, or it could be HER2 and EGFR, or 3 and EGFR. Um, it signals the cell to grow. The cell, the tumor cell proliferates, it survives, and it causes metastases. Whoops. That's why you want to interfere with this pathway by any means possible, whether it's with antibodies or with T cells, for example. Uh, the antibody-mediated interference is shown on the lower left of your screen here. This is a antibody, an anti-EGFR antibody. So this is uh, something like Herbitux or Herceptin that binds the receptor on the surface. Uh, it prevents this activating, this signaling intracellular signaling pathway, and it shuts down growth and metastasis. So that's how the process works. We want to develop antibodies or T cells that bind this protein and turn off this cell growth, this tumor growth um, uh, activating factor. Okay, here's a very simple cartoon of this family of proteins. <laughs> you can see they make what are called homodimers, and that's EGFR with another EGFR. Heterodimers is when uh, there are two different proteins that uh, group together on the surface of the tumor cell, and all of them are, si are growth and uh, uh, signaling pathways that cause tumor growth. Uh, this, again, is a dynamic process. Individual tumor cells are rearranging these receptors all the time. This is one reason that tumors become resistant or refractory to various chemotherapies or even antibody therapies is that, for example, if you use Herceptin and it only binds HER2, uh, if the HER2 protein rearranges with HER3 or HER4 or EGFR, the therapy no longer works because it's only specific for HER2. So uh, HER2 is a target in uh, uh, osteosarcoma therapy. Um, Camille knows that very well, of course. Uh, this is a monoclonal antibody that's being used uh, in treating osteosarcoma. Uh, this is Herceptin. Uh, there are so-called CAR T cells that have Herceptin-specific receptors. Uh, I'm sorry, HER2-specific receptors uh, that have been used uh, or that are, continue to be used in osteosarcoma. And then uh, uh, 
uh, Herceptin linked to a toxic drug is also um, uh, being uh, examined for uh, osteosarcoma therapy. So you can also have small molecules. Everything is designed to interrupt this signaling pathway of this family of proteins. I won't go into great detail um, about how this works. The important thing is that you find any way possible to block those receptors getting together and signaling and activating growth. So let me get to the therapy that we've developed, which is a peptide, a protein or a peptide-based therapy. Uh, I'm leaving out a lot of the intellectual input here, but the important stuff is that all of these proteins in this family, EGFR, HER2, and HER3, are very similar. They're in, in fact, they're identical in many regions of the proteins, and that was an advantage to us. Uh, you can see that here. So, for example, human, mouse, and dog EGFR protein are virtually identical at this site except for this uh, red K. It's the only difference uh, within this sequence. Same thing with HER3. Uh, human and canine HER3 are virtually identical. Human HER2, again, identical at this region. We use that in our favor to develop a vaccine made of this peptide. And if immune responses arise to this peptide, our intent was that antibodies to the EGFR site will bind the HER3 site and the HER2 site, all because they have the same sequence uh, and it's expressed on the surface of the tumor. Now, why is that important? Well, when these receptors rearrange, uh, and they form different dimers on the surface, it doesn't matter what they rearrange because this immune response binds all three proteins. So it's not restricted just to one. We know a lot about the structure and the sequence. This is a crystal structure of the EGFR protein on the surface. So we know a lot about how it looks and shapes and all of these things. That helps design therapies. So let me get to the studies in our dogs. And we first did this with a uh, colleague down in Norwalk, Connecticut, about 30 miles from here at his clinic, uh, Jerry Post. Uh, we were actually interviewed on MSNBC a, a few years ago. Um, I'm not made for TV, obviously. That's why I put uh, Jerry's picture on. Uh, this is a simple vaccination uh, and a booster vaccination three weeks later. In that manner, it virtually resembles COVID vaccination, for example, where you get the first vaccine uh, on day one, for example, and the second vaccine three weeks later. Essentially the same approach. Uh, I've already talked about this. I'll go by this. Um, lots of fun stories. I could go on and on. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, people who have lost their spouses and that their dogs are really their their primary companion in life, and now they've got cancers, and uh, uh, so it's really fun. My dogs are at my feet right here, actually, two golden retrievers. Uh, dog cancer that express this family of proteins include, uh, again, mammary carcinoma, osteosarcoma uh, in very high frequency, uh, hemangiosarcoma, which resembles human disease as well, some lung cancers, uh, and a number of other cancers as well. Uh, for the purpose of today, I'm going to uh, focus on the osteosarcoma studies. So again, just to reiterate, human, mouse, and dog all look identical. We first started these studies in mouse models of cancer, uh, and we picked this site so that we could translate it to human therapy almost immediately if we wanted to. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the dogs have the same amino acid sequence. So it can go from mouse to dog to human almost flawlessly because all of us, uh, both mice and dogs and you and me, have the same sequence, same uh, type of protein at this site. We've published this work, so if you want to dive into the details, you were easy to find. Uh, so... We immunize dogs. Do we get an immune response? Yes. And that's what all these bars are. This is about a group of uh, 35 or so dogs. 
Uh, these long bars mean antibody responses to the tumor protein, just like in human cancers or human vaccinations, I'm sorry, um, the levels of immune response differ between individuals, both humans and dogs, and that's what we see here. The overall, when they're expressed as a group, uh, there's a big difference between dogs that get vaccinated uh, with the uh, with the uh, with what we've made versus those that do not. Uh, I won't talk about this today. The important stuff is: do they bind tumor cells? And that's what this shows. Uh, the antibodies shown in the dark colors here are immune sera that bind the tumors. These are three different tumor cell lines that all express EGFR or HER2. D17 is a dog tumor, A431 and MDA, this one, these are both human tumors. So the immune response we're getting is actually binding the EGFR protein right on the cell. So does it do what we want it to do with killing or potentially interfering with tumor growth? And the answer is yes. So we took the antibodies that we got from our vaccinated dogs and we asked, does it interfere with this signaling pathway that's on the left? Does it interfere? Does it block how EGFR or HER2 signal and trigger a tumor cell to multiply? And the answer is yes. This is a complicated slide. All you really have to look at here is this pre-immune which means there are no antibodies to the EGFR protein. They allow uh, the protein to get phosphorylated. That's the dark band. Here you see that that dark band goes away. That means that this has been completely blocked. So there's no signaling anymore in the tumor cell. That's what we want. That's what's going to hopefully eventually stop tumor cell growth. Do the antibodies find their way to tumors? This is osteosarcoma in dogs. The answer is yes. Uh, this is a dog tumor that doesn't have immune sera on it. Uh, and then as you can see under the immune panels, these are antibodies made to the surface proteins of this cancer. They glow green because they find their way to the osteosarcoma tumor and they bind to it. And then again, of course, based on that previous slide, hopefully they're interfering with tumor uh, signaling that uh, enhances growth. Do T-cells get there? Yes. Uh, these are those killer CD8 T-cells. Uh, all of these green objects are CD8 T-cells that have infiltrated the tumor. Hopefully they're doing their job as well. Uh, you don't find it in dogs that don't get vaccinated. So, the vaccine triggers both antibody responses and T cell responses. They home, they find their way to the tumor, they block signaling. This is a different type of tumor, bladder tumor that also, uh, it's a transitional cell carcinoma that also expresses EGFR and HER2. You can see how it glows. And again, that's a good thing. It's antibodies finding their way to the tumor. And this is really just the same example. Okay, metastases. Uh, we have some really good luck treating dogs uh, with lung metastases that first had osteosarcoma. This is one of our early patients, uh, Cody Rosa. Uh, he had an amputation because of his osteosarcoma. He failed other chemotherapies, uh, developed lung mets that you can see here. Uh, and over the course... <coughs> of about six or seven months, not only survived, but cleared that lung metastases, uh, went on to live another three and a half or so years, uh, unfortunately passed away from a secondary cancer unrelated to this one uh, three or four years later. And then these are just other examples of lung metastases uh, disappearing after, in this case, uh, over the course of about four months. Uh, as we all know, uh, metastases to the lung are what causes morbidity in this type of cancer. So this is a terrific uh, observation for us. Uh, the, the one, getting back to the immunology here, one way that we clear 
both pathogens and clear tumors better is by a concept called epitope spreading. Uh, very simply put, all it means is that if your immune system attacks lots of sites on that pathogen or lots of proteins on that tumor, you do a lot better job of clearing it and killing it. Uh, there's a pathway that we defined in years ago now in our laboratory of how this happens. So for example, in our protein, our peptide that binds and activates B cells, there may be four different sites on the protein, uh, three different uh, white blood cells bind different sites after they get digested by that antigen presenting cell. And now we have three different antibodies that arise. They all go to the tumor. Uh, they all help uh, slow or stop tumor division, tumor cell division. Uh, and survival, of course, which is important. So uh, the standard of care in dogs uh, is amputation and uh, chemotherapy, in this case, carboplatin or doxorubicin. 12-month survival is about 35 to 40%. Uh, in dogs that get standard of care plus our vaccine, it's up to about 65 to 75%. So we've almost doubled 12-month doubled survival. Uh, in this scenario, Dr. Mamula, what's the um, sequencing? Like when do you give the vaccine versus the chemo? Uh, great question. Uh, in our experience, it... Early on in the early studies, we were giving vaccine after they finished their five cycles of chemotherapy of carboplatin or doxorubicin. Now we know that those chemotherapies don't interfere with the vaccine response. So we do them simultaneously. We can do them at the same time with good outcomes. So our approach is the earlier, the better for vaccination. Um, Camille may have experience with this. They've Camille, did uh, when you used the Listeria vaccine, did they? I assume they measured your antibody and T cell responses to her two. I'm actually not sure if my her two was ever tested. I think it was just kind of assumed that most people with osteosarcoma have the her two um, mutation. So I don't think mine was, but mm. um, yeah, I bet you could find that out if you dug a little deeper. So the other wrinkle that we want to add is adding checkpoint inhibitors. Again, this, uh, since we're getting short on time, I'm really going to go past this because we haven't formally started these studies yet. We're collaborating with an investigator at Ohio State, which has a vac uh, developed a vaccine to trigger antibodies to PD, um, PD-1. So uh, that's what you see here, our antibodies developing to PD-1. We are eventually going to combine this with our vaccine to see if we can get uh, responses to be better. Uh, these are some happy texts that I received. Um, dogs that went into remission and it, that did very well. Uh, there's a uh, dog, Kiko, who has a large following on Instagram that uh, we treated and did very well. I so. totally know. It's like Kiko and Watson, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I you know them. <laughs> Very funny. The owner is kind of mentioned us a long time ago in her Instagram uh, string and like, oh yeah, we also got this Yale vaccine. Um, and Kiko did really well for a long time. We kind of really didn't get much more attention than just a brief passing thank you. <laughs> but Kiko was part of our early clinical trials. So there are other reasons to use this vaccine. Immune responses enhance things like radiation, palliative radiation sensitivity, makes tumors more sensitive to radiation. And so we're testing all of these things. But the important thing is that we have a neoantigen. It makes antibodies, makes T cells a home to the tumor. They block growth pathways. Uh, and at least in a number of cases, uh, help clear METs. Uh, the ones that are important in osteosarcoma in the lung, for example. Uh, thanks to lots of people. Uh, the Canine Cancer Research Foundation, Mary Maida, who may be on this uh, in this group, um, 
supports his studies financially, and uh, as do others, Alva Greenberg, and uh, we've had some grants in the past. These are my two pups now. This is my own dog died of a, uh, passed away from a cancer about 10 years ago. Uh, she's the one on the right, the lower right. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I went a little longer than I probably wanted to, but let's stop sharing and I can take questions. Yeah, that was great. That was such a clear explanation of the um, immunity cycle. And so that was actually super helpful to get that up front. Um, mm. I think we had, Camille, do you want to take the question that we got in? Yeah, of course. Um, so a question from the audience is, um, is the HER2 marker commonly tested in people and canines diagnosed with osteosarcoma? Great question. Uh, it honestly depends on your oncologist. If they're considering HER2 or EGFR-based therapies, yes, they will do. There's a way to stain, just like you saw those green cells in, um, in the slides that I showed show where EGFR is. There are ways in the diagnostic lab that you can do similar technologies to see, literally see EGFR protein on the surface of tumor biopsies, for example. The problem is that the technology is not perfect. Um, the things that are used to detect EGFR and HER2 are just for humans and for dogs are not perfect. Sometimes, for example, this was shown by four different labs that diagnose HER2 on the surface of cancers. They got the same samples. They compared their outcomes or, or the results that they were reporting, and many of the labs were very different. Some reported lower intermediate levels, some high levels, and this is all on the same sample. So it's just the technology is not perfect yet. So that's the only rub that's the only drawback to understanding what's going on. In fact, some human cancers that have been described in the laboratory, in the pathology laboratories, being low expressors do really well with Herceptin or Herbitux. Um, they, their clinical outcomes are good, even though they were their original tumors were shown to have be low expressing. So it's either again, uh, a problem with the detection system, or maybe you just don't need very many, much level of this protein on the surface of tumors to be attacked and to be effective uh, with these monoclonal antibodies. All right, we have another question for you. Um, when will this be available for pediatric clinical trial? In humans. In your that, hands, yeah. That's that's a great question. Um, we are trying to develop it. We the the uh, wheels turn a bit slower in human clinical trials than for canine clinical trials, as you can imagine. The bar is much higher for treating humans. Uh, we hope to get there as uh, we Yale and. Uh, has patented this idea and it is patented for both use in dogs and in humans. Uh, if there was uh, a company, for example, that want, we're personally do, I'm sort of personally doing uh, the dog therapy myself. I started a small company to uh, move this forward. Uh, I will probably license the technology if there are any uh, pharma groups that are interested in in using this, and again, the the advantage is the utility that in the real science and the medicine that we've defined already in dog osteosarcoma. All right, and then another question is, how do we get the vaccine and work with um, oncology teams to get this sort of treatment uh, for dogs or humans? <laughs> well, for dogs. I'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we've got to get this in the hands of uh, a clinical trials group, either uh, funded or uh, um, uh, supported by pharma or 
uh, I suppose, other academic institutions. It's a difficult and long process. And there are a lot of, as you can imagine, there are a lot of competing therapies. So lots of institutions, as you probably experienced, Camille, have their favorites. Uh, you found one at Penn. Uh, that Listeria vaccine is not found everywhere. It's not even the favorite of all oncologists for osteosarcoma. I'm sure you had to weigh many opinions in choosing your own therapy, um, such is the case here, honestly, is that even if we introduce this in the human market, there's Listeria that has a similar strategy. The strategy of the Listeria vaccine is to trigger immune responses to HER2, as does ours. So which one would you pick? Which one would I pick? Um, I honestly, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. It's a difficult decision for patients, obviously. For sure. Um, and then another question is what about the PET slash spec? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, imaging age for her two and EGFR have those been used to identify patients? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's again, it, it's, it's a technology that's less sensitive than what we can do with tumor biopsies at the laboratory bench. So probably the most sensitive and the most specific, again, even though they're not perfect, uh, are done out of uh, tumor biopsies. You, you know, you can also do, you can measure RNA for these proteins out of tumor cells. Again, it's having the technology at hand uh, which is found in lots of academic institutions, not necessarily all over. I know there was another question about the um, human listeria trial, which we'll try to answer because we're almost out of time. Um, but I did, I had so many other questions I wanted to ask. So I'm trying to pick my favorite question to ask you, Dr. Ramula, but maybe I will ask about combining um, vaccines with other immunotherapies. Um, so combining um, vaccine with CAR-T or with antibodies. And like in my very, you know, basic, I need to like have these analogies to help me kind of better understand. So, you know, I always think of checkpoint inhibitors as like um, stopping the brakes, you know, on the car and maybe like RT and NK cells where you're kind of adding more gas to the tank, like adding more fuel. And so I'm trying to kind of think of like a similar analogy for vaccines because it's it's almost like you're kind of like, you're it's like giving it a booster somehow, right? Like you're yeah. like priming the engine with I don't know much about cars, so it's probably not a great analogy for me. <laughs> but you may be using some like special, you know, oil or something to help prime the engine and really like. Yeah. But so, um, I don't know. No, that's a perfect question. I think I know where you're going, which is yeah. the reason we're using checkpoint. We want to use checkpoint inhibitors. The peptide will make antibodies. The peptide will trigger T cells. Those T cells may get turned off at the site of the tumor. So that's where. The checkpoint inhibitor would keep those T cells alive and keep them attacking the tumor. Now, one problem that's inherent in human therapies is that a particular company that is, say, the Listeria therapy or the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, they often want to know what's just the efficacy of just our drug. They don't seek patients to use both, say, Listeria or our vaccine along with a checkpoint inhibitor. So they otherwise they wouldn't know which one's doing most of the work, right? And obviously if it were you or I, I would I would want everything thrown at me. I'd want checkpoint inhibitors. I'd want CAR T cells all at the same time. Your clinician will not do that for you. They just will not. It's uh First of all, they can't get insurance companies to pay for anything like that because there are no studies that have used all of those combination therapies unless you're in a clinical trial. But if you walk in as the average patient and ask for, just give me everything. I know CAR T cells are out there. I know Mamula's vaccine is out there. I know uh, checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 and PD-L1, give them, give them both to me, right? They just, they won't do that. And there are ethical reasons and sure. side effects to all of these drugs. So there are good reasons they don't do that. But um, 
I mean, theoretically, would it be safer to use a checkpoint inhibitor with a vaccine versus checkpoint inhibitor with um, CAR T cells? Just because, you know, with CAR T cells, you're infusing this huge amount, right? So it's like, whereas with a vaccine, you're just kind of like helping your own body better identify. Uh, those we'd have to like just prove with science. Yeah. I like I like your approach because it obviously favors our therapy, but uh, well. <laughs> You know, we, the medical community needs real data and real science to prove that. I, you know, and I'd love to do that. We we intend to do that actually. Yeah, that that little pesky thing called evidence, scientific evidence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is um, what we appreciate, folks like you for. So thank you so much, Dr. Manuela, for joining us on Osteobites today and for making it better for osteosarcoma patients, both. Um, doggies and um, humans. Hopefully this will ultimately transfer um, to the humans. Um, more information on this and all osteobites can be found on the MIB Agents YouTube channel, on our website at mibagents.org and at your favorite podcast place. And please join us next week on Thursday, the 31st of August. We're going to be talking to Dr. Michael Bishop from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And he's going to be talking about um, multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors or MTPIs in combination with chemotherapy for osteosarcoma. And his presentation is gonna be describing existing data on the use of MTKIs in advancing osteosarcoma, in advanced osteosarcoma, and considerations of the development of a prospective COG clinical trial, combining an MTKI, cabozantinib, with cytotoxic chemotherapy for patients with newly diagnosed um, osteosarcoma. So you can find our Osteobytes lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for future topics you'd like to hear about, please share them with us at events at mibagents.org. Thank you again to Dr. Mamula. Thank you, Camille, so much for joining us today. And for all of you for spending an hour with us today. We hope to see you back here next week on Osteobytes when we chat with Dr. Bishop. Thanks, everyone.